All right. Well, welcome to tonight's call. I'm really excited to talk about your brain, your personality, and your immunity. And, you know, there's a field of science called psychoneuroimmunology, and just hearing that word might scare you away and cause you to turn off this video, but please don't because we're going to make it uh, relatable to you. And, and you'll see, I, I want to teach this to the public or to the layperson because we're living this every day. Um, my goal is at the end of this video for you to be able to connect or to understand how uh, your personality and your brain and how your brain is wired and interconnected directly impact your immunity and therefore can impact your risk of autoimmune disease, your risk of chronic inflammation, your risk of cancer, et cetera. So let's dive in. And we're going to start with the brain. But before we go there, I just want to say that, you know, this isn't medical advice. This is just education. If you are not a patient of mine that I know thoroughly and specifically, um, then don't make any changes until you've spoken to your doctor that knows you thoroughly and specifically. And so the brain, how does it work? For most people, we know we have a brain. Uh, we, we know that it does the thinking and the speaking and all of that for us. But but from there, we just pretty much move on with our lives. But um, I am obviously very biased and, and have done a lot of training in neurology and functional neurology and all of that. And so my bias is that there's nothing cooler uh, or more interesting than the human brain and nervous system and how it's integrated with everything else. It's just amazing. Like, uh, no matter what we learn, there's always more to learn. So the first thing to know is that our brain has, and we're going to talk about the brain, we're going to talk about the cortex tonight, which is the newest part of the brain. It's, it's when someone says brain, it's what you visualize. It's the two lobes that you see here. And we have a right lobe, which is the viewer's right and the left, the color side of the screen, and the left lobe or left hemisphere is the viewer's left and is the black, white, and gray side of the screen. And when you're born, you're right-brained. And we, we develop the right brain first, and the right brain is big picture. The right brain is imagination and creativity. And you can see down the right side of the page, it's art and music and emotion and dreaming and colors and, 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 you know, big pictures. Okay. So we develop our right brain. We're born with our right brain and we're pretty much right brain from age zero to two. And think of your toddlers, right? They're not going to, uh, most of them aren't going to spell words or read or do math for you, but they're going to draw like crazy. Uh, they're going to love music. They're going to emote well, uh, or maybe too well sometimes. Okay, they're creative and fun and just want to play. And then from age two to four, we switch and we start to develop that left brain. And then every two years from there until maturity, which, you know, and women is about 18 and men is about 21, 22, you're going in and give or take two year cycles of reference right brain, left brain, right brain, left brain, ping ponging back and forth to develop the two hemispheres. And what's happening is you're developing them, but you're also, the key is that they're integrating or becoming connected side to side. So the right is color, big picture, creativity, art, music. The left is details. The left is where the verbal or speech centers live. The left is where math and reading and, and, directions and linear thinking and order lives okay so if we want to get super stereotypical you know the right brain are the free spirit people the left brain are the super analytical people okay the left brain um left left most people tend to be left brained left side of the brain controls right side of the body most people are right-handed and so being right hand dominant you're going to be triggering that left hemisphere neurology more often, right? If you move your right arm, you fire your left brain. Uh, so being left-handed fits the right brain descriptions, right? They're more free-spirited, they're more artistic, they're more musical, right? So that left hand, whenever they're using it, or that left foot is firing the right brain. 
So, you know, there's a key for rehab later on when we talk, okay? So the key is though, we don't necessarily want to be dominant in either of these. We want to be balanced. We want to have good integration. We want to be artsy, but we also want to be able to do math when we need to, okay? We want to think in fine details, but we also need to see the big picture, okay? So we want to have balance. And what we're going to talk about today is that if you get imbalanced or dominant one hemisphere over the other, that can impact your personality, that can impact your immunity, that can impact your disease or health states. So here's a simple picture helping you understand right brain people, left brain people. We all have a right and a left brain, but we all have, we all tend to um, be or prefer one over the other. We should be able to get into one or the other depending on what we're trying to accomplish. So if we have an imbalance or dominance one side over the other, what does that look like? Well, if you have a, a right brain dominance, right? If you're artsy, musical, creative, how do those kids do in school? How are they perceived in school? What do the teachers think of them? Okay, a lot of times, unfortunately, those kids are quote unquote diagnosed by their teacher who is not a healthcare professional as having ADD or ADHD or some behavioral issue. But do they, or are they just a monkey trapped in a cage? right? The, the, our school system forces kids to be left-brained, forces them to sit down, be quiet, sit still, do your math, do your reading, do your spelling. Well, all of that is left-brained. So if I'm a right-brained kid, you know, th th there's maybe not anything worse you could do to me than to put me in a chair for eight hours and say, sit still and do your math, right? And so those kids can be labeled as learning disability or, you know, bad behavior kids, Etc. And so, you know, we, we have to go beyond the label and it'd be nice if these things were taught to our teachers so they could understand um, that different kids learn differently. And, and I think the teachers do understand that. It's, this should be taught to whoever's setting our school system here, the structure of our classrooms, because they need to realize, hey, everyone's not a textbook or everyone's not a left brain kid there's differences and different kids learn differently so if you're right brained and you're in school you're, you may not do well the left brain kids are going to excel because they want to sit down they want to do that math do that reading and focus and concentrate but the right brain kids don't so if we've got if you have a kid that's struggling in school, it may not be anything intrinsically wrong with your child. It may not be anything, you know, you haven't failed as a parent necessarily. It may be a square peg, round hole kind of deal, okay? It may be you have a right brain child who is in a left brain system. And it may be, you know, I said earlier that you have your right brain zero to two, left brain two to four, right brain four to six, left brain six to eight. Well, that's, you know, that's textbook stuff. Kids don't necessarily develop strictly to those age ranges, right? So you might be, you might have a child who's right brain from two to three, right? And so it throws it off. So your, your, right, your hemispheric dominance may not match your age the way you'd expect it to. And so maybe they're just a little behind and not necessarily say developmentally behind, but that's just what that kid is, okay? So a lot of talk to say, your child may not have a learning disability, they just may be more right-brained than the average kid. And so how can we foster that or utilize that and make that an advantage instead of a disadvantage? If you have a right-brained kid who's struggling with math, well, maybe they need to learn their multiplication table to music right? Or maybe you have to use manipulatives or colors or, you know, color by number or whatever to teach them their math, right? So we can take their perceived weakness by the system and use it as a strength. How do we leverage their creativity and art and music bias to make them interested in reading and math, etc.? So that's one way it could manifest early in life. Um, 
and then that could continue, you know, and it's, it's, it's tragic if it does, but if they're labeled one of these things because they're right brained, that can start to impact their emotions, right? And maybe they think or perceive themselves as the dumb kid or the slow kid or, or whatever adjective they're gonna use. And that can lead to, you know, self-confidence issues, self-esteem issues, maybe anxiety, depression issues. And then they grow up into an adult with a teenager and or adult with anxiety and depression. And how does that impact, how does that relate to the brain? So if we go back to the brain here, the right brain, we said art, big picture music, okay? Well, the right brain, the neurotransmitter that's dominant in the right brain is serotonin. The, the neurotransmitter that's dominant in the left brain is dopamine. So these things have clinical relevance. Serotonin, what, are, what kind of medication are depressed people given? They're given Prozac, you know, so SSRI, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. So if someone has an issue uh, with the right brain deficit, they may be more likely to be depressed. If someone has an issue with a left brain deficit and a dopaminergic deficit, they may have slower movements, um, you know, slower speech, you know, all the way up to, from a Parkinson's standpoint, Parkinson's is a, is a dopamine issue as part of what Parkinson's is, right? So you could think of Parkinson's as the extreme end range of dopamine issues. So the neurotransmitters matter in the hemisphericity of the brain. The right brain likes serotonin more, uses serotonin more. The left brain uses dopamine more. And so if we're having issues uh, inefficiencies, insufficiencies of those things that could lead to neurocognitive symptoms or psychiatric symptoms such as anxiety, depression, uh, ADHD, ADD, et cetera. So if we have a cerebral lateralization, it's the nerd term for it, but a right or left hemisphere dominance, that not only impacts your brain and your learning, but can also impact your personality. Okay. Uh, if you are, for example, right brained in a positive way and you have lots of serotonin, you're feeling good. You're happy. You know, you're, you're up on stage performing. You're not worried about people, what people are thinking of you, right? You're just in kind of in la la land. You're in that imagination state, that creative state in the zone. Right. Um, if you're, if you're someone who's left brained and you you're left brain dominant and you're really efficient with dopamine. You could be very motivated. You get things done. You're very uh, efficient. You might be very type A. So these things can work for and against us. So how might this play out in our immunity? Okay. Autoimmune disease, cancer, chronic inflammation, infection, these things have a right and left brain connection. Cerebral lateralization is tied to your immune status. Remember, it's psycho neuroimmunology. So your, your, your psychology, your neurology, and your immune system are all tied together. So what does that look like for the immune system? This study was published in the Annals of Neurology in 2004. And the title is The Role of Cerebral Lateralization in Control of Immune Processes in Humans. And so cerebral lateralization, like we said, is just left or right hemisphere dominance. Okay, I'm going to help you digest the, the science jargon on this slide and in this study, but it's really cool to understand this. So I'll read it to you and, and help, help you understand it. Cerebral lateralization may be important in neural control of immune function. Okay, so if you have a left brain or right brain dominance, these authors want to look at, is that important in how your nervous system controls immune function? Yes, it is, we're gonna see. Animal studies have demonstrated different differential effects of left and right brain lesions on immune functions. Here we show that resections in humans, so resections in the language dominant hemisphere of patients with epilepsy, okay? So all they're saying is if they take out parts of the left hemisphere, language dominant is the left side because that's where language is. The left brain is where language is, okay? So if they take out left brain in humans, there's a reduction 
of white blood cells, of total T cells, and helper T cells. Okay, so reduction of lymphocytes, total T cells, helper T cells. So those are our white blood cells, and T cells are our main killers. So if we lose left brain, if we take out left brain, there's a reduction in immunity. In contrast, if we take out right brain, which is the language non-dominant hemisphere, okay, the side where language isn't, that's the right side. If we take out right brain, there's an increase in those white blood cells. There's increased lymphocytes, increased total T cells, increased helper T cells. So if we take out left brain, we lose immunity. If we take out right brain, our immunity will go up, okay? So potentially increased inflammation, et cetera. And then later they say flare skin responses were reduced by left brain resections and increase after right brain resections. So they showed the same result in how the skin responses uh, or how the, yeah, how flare skin responses occur. Okay. So think of like a, uh, an allergy test or something like that. If you take out the left brain, it's a weaker response. If you take out the right brain, the skin response is greater. So what does that mean? Okay, let's look at this. We've seen this in multiple videos recently under, you know, talking about different um, topics, but this is a great study titled Mechanisms of Immune Suppression by B-Cells. And we've got uh, three pictures here that are looking at the immune system in response to an antigen. Okay, and we don't necessarily have to go over this in detail like we have in other videos, but I'll go over enough just to help us understand um, in relation to the brain. So picture A, the yellow is, is an infection, okay? The green is the pro-inflammatory immune response. The pink is the anti-inflammatory immune response. So in any infection or any wound or any inflammatory, you know, any, any trauma to the body, the infection happens in the context here of infection. The infection is going to happen first, so the yellow peak goes up. There's a short time delay, and then the immune system notices we're infected. So the, the green hill is going to go up, or the green hump goes up to, to start that pro-inflammatory response and knock down the virus. When the virus is sufficiently knocked down, the, the pink anti-inflammatory response ramps up to quiet the pro-inflammatory response and resolve the inflammation. Right? We don't want to stay inflamed if the virus is gone because then we only have self to attack. So in a normal, healthy immune response, we have the infection, we go pro-inflammatory to kill and clear the infection, then we go anti-inflammatory to, to knock down the pro-inflammatory immune response and resolve the inflammation and clean up. That's normal. Okay, That's what we see in when left and right brain are balanced. Remember, left brain increases immune response, right brain decreases immune response, okay? So in this case, in A, we had equal, we have a balanced brain. There's not a dominance there, left to right, okay? In picture B, we have the same infection and you see the green shoot way up and stay up. So we, we create a pro-inflammatory response. We easily clear the virus, but then we stay inflamed because the pink, the anti-inflammatory response cannot mount, cannot grow or, or become robust enough to suppress that pro-inflammatory response. We don't have enough anti-inflammatory capacity, right? So which, which brain dominance would that be based on what we've learned on this call? Is it left brain high, right brain low, or is it right brain high, left brain low? Write it down. Boom, were you right? So this picture, picture B, is the left brain dominant. The left brain is high relative to the right brain. So when left brain is dominant, remember in the previous studies, when they took out the right brain, the inflammatory cells went up, okay? So if you look here, when they, when they uh, took out the right brain, increased numbers of lymphocytes, T cells, okay? So we've got normal as A, B is left brain dominant. So when you have a left brain dominance that promotes inflammation, it, it, it promotes 
a pro-inflammatory response. And if that becomes pathologic, yeah, you may clear the virus, but then you're only attacking yourself from there. Picture C is you have the infection and you have the green pro-inflammatory response occur, but it's not robust enough to clear the infection. And then the pink response is big. Your anti-inflammatory response is too large. So not only can you not mount a, a, so that's got a double whammy, excuse me. It's not allowing you to inflame enough to kill the virus. So you, it promotes chronic infection. So you're chronically infected and chronically inflamed because you keep trying to mount the response that isn't robust enough to clear the virus because of your large anti-inflammatory response or your large immune suppressive response. So there's only one thing that can be, right? For you left brain people out there, you know what the next answer is. This one, picture C, is the right brain is dominant relative to the left brain, okay? So a right brain dominance, when you take out the left brain, that suppresses the immune system in the previous study, right? So if you have a, an imbalance of a right dominance over a left brain, that's promoting this type of picture, okay? So you may not, you may be chronically infected in this scenario. So don't necessarily think that if your kid is left brained or if you're left brained or right brain dominant, that your immune systems are off by this, are, are necessarily pathologically off like this. But I just want you to understand that it may be contributing. And so from an autoimmune perspective, if you're, if you're B or C, that could lead to autoimmunity because chronic inflammation right? And in the case of B, if you have lab high inflammation without any foreign target to attack, then there's only you to attack. So when you attack self, that's auto inflaming, that's autoimmunity, okay? In picture C, you can develop autoimmunity by being chronically infected and that chronic infection sharing molecular mimicry with your self tissues, and now you have cross-reactive autoimmunity your immune system shooting your own tissues because they look like the chronic infection that you have. So a brain imbalance could promote autoimmunity either way, if you're left dominant or right dominant, if all the uh, chips fall into place in the wrong way for you. So this is how your brain, your personality, and your immune system line up and influence each other and could result in a strong immune response and no problem, or in chronic infection or autoimmunity or other pro-inflammatory diseases. So I hope this took psychoneuroimmunology and made it digestible for you. I hope you learned something. And if you'd like to learn more, I've written a best-selling book on Amazon called The Autoimmune Answer that talks more about immunology and talks specifically about autoimmune disease and how these factors play a role in different autoimmune diseases. Uh, if you're looking for a detective to work with, you can check us out at functionalmedicinecharlotte.com and, and maybe partner with us on your case. And if you'd like to learn more from a video perspective, we have over 800 videos on YouTube at the link provided. So thank you for participating and sharing this video and let's open it up for questions. You know, I don't know if I so much have a question other than like, I mean, I feel like I was trying to take all of the notes I can because I'm looking at, I mean, Noelle and when all of her stuff started and she falls in your two to four category for being left brained mm -hmm. for that age group and being inflamed. Yeah. Like, <laughs> what do we do? Start doing a bunch of right-brained activities? Uh, it's, po it's possible that that could help. So if, if, if there's yeah. definitely a left brain dominance, then you'd want to work right brain, right? And so what, what side of the body does the right brain control? Quiz. Left side. Yeah, right? So you could do things like, hey, I want to stimulate that right brain. Let's have her... Um, do things left, let's have her throw left-handed or kick right 
or kick left footed or you know just you can do things they're called nonlinear complex movements so you you spell the alphabet really big with your arms or your legs or you can just stimulate or put vibration on her left arm or right arm um, have her close her eyes and put a key in her hand and ask her what it is and put a ball in her hand and ask her what it is then yeah. put a toothbrush in her hand and ask her what it is so um, um, there's 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 lots of different ways to do it and that could be a whole video on itself uh, I mean there's there's if she were paralyzed there's eye movements you can do to stimulate right and left brain there's there's all kinds of stuff um, so uh, you could put music you know nature sounds in her left ear to stimulate mm -hmm. right brain you can do you can use smells in just her right nostril you can put flavors on just her right side of her tongue uh, so there's lots of different things to stimulate to preferentially stimulate different hemispheres and different even more specifically different areas of the brain uh, but those should be enough to get you started yeah i mean it i mean it has me thinking like i don't know that's that's incredible it's just incredible like it's her left knee which she is favored and not used mm -hmm for the longest time yeah. yeah so so that you know that left knee is feeding to right brain right so part of a potential deficit could be you know she's favoring and not moving that as much as we'd want her to uh and the the leg fires to the the medial cortex so medial is middle lateral would be outside right so um the legs fire to the medial cortex whereas the arms lips hands fire to the lateral side so there's different um, functions and and things spread out on the brain so yeah the 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 that knee and the lack of movement is big because movement is life right movement drives the brain movement uh, drives the brain development so that's why we want babies to crawl you know parents who are like hey my baby went straight to walking that's not good we need babies to crawl so they can integrate right and left side. Okay. Um, so there's, there's a, there's a lot to it, but yeah, getting her, getting her moving and it, say she's not going to walk or say that that knee has, has, um, you know, bony growth that will not let her ever extend it fully. Okay. Well then we still, you can still move it through the full range of motion that she has. You could still fire those pathways by starting down at the feet and fire the, you know, fire the foot because that has to go up past the knee, right? So you're still sending, you're still sending input from that leg to those areas. Um, so you know, we do what we can in the context of the limitations of matter. But those activities work in adults as well? Yep. As long as you have a brain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, there's, there's, your neurology is wired. All of our right brains control our left sides, unless we have, you know, we we're someone born with a half brain or something like that. But um, in the context of the average human being, you know, without crazy outline scenarios, yes. If you want to fire the right brain, move that left side of the body. What else? Oh, so here's a way if anyone knows someone with Parkinson's. Okay, there's Parkinson's, there's multiple signs of uh of parkinson's that occur before the first tremor and maybe a decade before the first tremor uh, the very first one i talk about in my book the, the harbinger of parkinson's is constipation that occurs uh you know up to 10 years before the first tremor another very common issue is right shoulder pain who can tell me why that might contribute super bonus points if you there's two ways one's easy we've talked about it and one's harder that i did talk about but it was a long time ago in this meeting so parkinson's is is primarily which side of the brain must be left if it affects the right shoulder there you go boom so bonus points 
if you start losing shoulder mobility because of shoulder pain, right? We're losing that input to left brain. So we can start to atrophy, say, okay? And do you remember what neurotransmitter dominated in the left brain? Dopamine. Dopamine, right? And in Parkinson's, there's a dopamine lack issue, right? So we, the, the, this person develops right shoulder pain, they stop moving that arm, that arm would drive left brain, which would drive dopaminergic function, which would keep the basal ganglia alive there. So we lose dopamine, we lose basal ganglia firing, and now they start to get mass face and drooling and slow down and shuffle and tremor, hmm. right? So if, if we can just keep people moving, right? Um, we can help delay these things. Can't they just go in there and somehow stimulate parts of the brain and non-stimulate parts of the brain to sort of jumpstart your body or something or your immune system? Could they do that? Call that exercise. Um, I say that half tongue in cheek, but yeah, we do call it exercise, but there is, there are deep brain stimulators that they can surgically go down and, and put in. But, um, you know, I've had Parkinson's patients that had that, that it wasn't the, the, uh, magic they were hoping for. And then of course you're damaging brain tissue to go in there and put it in. Right. So, um, movement is going to be best. And then nutrition matters, right? The brain needs oxygen. There's three nutrients that the brain absolutely must have oxygen, glucose, and stimulation. Okay. And the stimulation is that movement, learning, playing instrument, whatever novelty. So that's why, Hey, we, if you want to keep your grandparents from neurodegenerating, keep them in community with people, have them learn an instrument or play cards or so, you know, and hopefully walk or go to water aerobics or, you know, do chair squats. Um, you know, they're, they're, for Parkinson's, the research shows leg strength, keeping their leg strength up is key in delaying disease because where the legs fire centrally, and that's where the basal ganglia is, which is the main part of the brain that's degenerating in Parkinson's. So if we can, you know, have grandpa just do chair squats, you know, and keep his, keep his leg strength up, that's going to be stimulating that area, which drives his own endogenous production of dopamine without having to take levodopa carbidopa you know taking an exogenous source so the longer we can utilize lifestyle in this case exercise to keep moving and drive our physiology as natural as possible the longer we can delay potentially having to take um, in this case a, a, dop a dopamine agonist I know uh, my, I, I have had the honor of homeschooling our children mm -hmm. and our son has dyslexia and he comes from a long line of dyslexics, Paul's dyslexic and his brothers are and his father is and um, taking him to a, a specialist um, before I would read with him we would actually take a ball and cross throw back and forth, left mm -hmm. hand, right hand, left hand. And also, if he was going to sit down and look at a worksheet or something, um, you take the infinity symbol mm -hmm. and you draw that with your right hand and your yep. left hand, you're going back and forth and back and forth. Mm -hmm. So there must yeah. be something. Yeah, those are, those are called nonlinear complex movements. The, and the infinity sign, that's what I was doing with the limb. And you do it as big and exaggerated as you can because that fires the cerebellum. And the cerebellum is the main integrator of your neurology. So um, balance, focus, concentration, integrating speech and thought and all of that. So the, the, um, the cerebellum is, is same-sided. So if I'm firing the left moving the left arm to hit my right cortex, I'm hitting my left cerebellum while I'm doing it. So if you want to drive, and this is, might be a little too much, but if you, if you want to drive cerebellum, which is the main integrator, right? If we have it in a, in a hemispheristy or an imbalance of the hemispheres, then we can use the cerebellum, which is the main integrator to help with that, right? So the movement stimulates, movement drives all parts of the brain, not just the, not just the, 
the lobes that we're trying to target, but also it happens to be the brainstem and the cerebellum, which is the main integrator to help us connect those lobes. So it's awesome that whoever whoever you're working with was doing good work in trying to turn on and integrate his brain before you had him sit down and study and learn. Because if you turn it on and optimize integration, he's going to get the most out of that study session. So glad you had a, a quality person That's there. Right. That's right. And it was really funny because uh, our daughter is academic, our son is a doer, and mm -hmm. he can't sit still. And um, he, when he was young, I, you know how they always say, okay, kids, let's sit down in a circle and I'm going to read to you and all that. So my daughter, she'd get in my lap and we'd read and we'd have, you know, cuddle session, whatever. And I tried that with my son and it didn't work. So one day, and he was very young and we always read books above their grade because it read aloud, you can do that. Mm -hmm. And so he was playing with his Tonka trucks or something. I thought, well, let's just see how this goes. And we, I read to him and the next day I picked up the book and I said, oh, okay, now uh, where do we leave off? And he just said, oh, it's when the little boy went, I was blown away because you look at him, he looks like he's all into his playing with his <laughs> trucks and all that stuff. He knew exactly what the storyline was and what yeah. was going on. It yeah. was amazing. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. I have a, one of my daughters is similar. She, um, you know, if you have her read, she's behind on fluency and all that stuff, but she, and you sit there with her and you're like, man, I'm struggling to even know what happened because it's so slow. Like, I'm just, I can't focus because it's so slow, you know? Um, and, but she knows, she knows everything she read after, like comprehension wise, she knows it all. And so um, it, it's interesting because she's the right brain theatrical performer. Like she'll go out in the middle of the street and dance and sing at the top of her lungs if there's one person or a hundred people and she doesn't even know. Like she knows, but she doesn't realize that people are there where you or I would be like, no, I'm embarrassed. I'm not singing in front of anybody, you know? Um, and she knows if, uh, if she watched a Pixar movie like two years ago, we were talking this weekend about Cars 3. She found a car at the playground that had, you know, uh, Lightning McQueen's enemy in that movie. And I was like, who's that? I don't remember. I know it's from that movie, but who is it? And she's like, that's Storm. And we hadn't seen it in forever, you know? And so right brain would be story and imagination, right? I wonder if he played Tonka trucks, if you were reading him like something not as interesting, like a research paper, would, would they still pick up on it? I don't know. That'd be interesting to look at. But yeah, that, that would that's a way, like I said earlier in the video, let's leverage their strengths. So put it to song or put it, make it creative or exciting or to a story instead of like cerebral lateralization and human immune function. 